I I teed you up with this, the low hanging fruit section. A few Ric Flair okay. questions. Now this is our third interview. I think I've asked one Ric Flair question all of them, so I've, I've banked yeah. a few of them up now. So I'm not sort of like a, a bludgeoning you with the, the 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 subject that everyone wants to hear from you about. But this is something I genuinely don't know, and okay. I'm not booked Terry, which is a, a great uh, reference. Uh, could you please explain the beef between himself and Ric Flair? I've been curious as to how it all got started, and I can't seem to find a definitive answer. And I really? don't know the, I don't know the defin- definitive answer anyway. Is it just when you went to WCW, he was booker, you didn't get on, or what was it specifically? Yeah, I, I, I'm surprised, because this is sort of like the, the Mark Madden story I wasn't aware of earlier. I'm surprised that somebody like you's not aware of this, because I've, I've said this so many times. But well, yes, well, I, I've, I've got my ideas and everything, but I don't know if there's like one specific instance where you thought, Mm, okay, you've sort of gone gone past the point now. Yeah. When you're that stage of your career, that neophyte stage of your career, you know, when you leave your wrestling school, in my case, Dominic Taducci's, you know how to do the arm drags and the body slams and the suplexes. Uh, you have no clue how to put them together. It's just, you know, these sort of general things, and now do I speed up here? Do I slow down? It, it's all Greek initially. Uh when I first went there, once I could see the NWA in Pittsburgh, which was around 78, I had grown up with WWF things. That's all we pretty much got in Pittsburgh. Excuse me. Now with the advent of cable, excuse me, I see uh, I can turn it on and watch it. And I'm mesmerized, right? Uh, having, been, having had an amateur wrestling background, the WWF, like the old stuff in WWF, it sort of looked like what I thought wrestling would if it went pro. But then I see this NWA stuff and I see Harley Race and I see Don Canoodle and Sergeant Slaughter and I see Steamboat and Jay Youngblood and I see Flair. And I am magnetized to it. It's wow. This is like a complete different level of professional wrestling. And actually, I was still dabbling in watching WWF, but I was watching the NWA pretty much and, and UWF exclusively. Uh, when I got there, uh, you know, I let these guys know, Harley and all those guys that I just mentioned, Sergeant and Carnoodle were gone by then, but like what, like a, a life changing as far as my wrestling fan eyes, how life changing this was like this took me just to a completely different place. And Flair specifically, I told like, you know, he was an, like a huge inspiration to me. And I was trying to do it in a way not to sound like a sycophant or like a creepy guy. I was like, like, dude, like <laughs> your, your work's incredible, you know? And, and well, he loved that. Right. <laughs> you know, tell, me, you know, tell me more, tell me more. And, uh, but again, as a kid at that stage of your career, you don't know exactly what to do, when to, how to fix it, if it goes wrong. And so I said to him and I prefaced it, I remember specifically saying, I know you're busy and if you don't have time, I totally understand. But if you ever watch, one of my matches and give me some feedback. I would really appreciate it. I'd, I'd, I'd really love that. You know, I just want to learn. And, and I said at the end again, but if you're too busy, I totally understand. He put his hand on this shoulder and said, it would be an honor, sir. Okay, great. Cool. Flair's going to give me some feedback. And over the next several weeks, I started getting very generic feedback. Um, good selling, good bumps, uh, good, Good comeback. Like never, hey, the arm drag was in the wrong place. Uh, this move looks sort of weak. Uh, you turned your back to the camera. There was never anything specific like that. So back then, when I still had knees, I would have the heel beat me in the corner, sh- turnbuckle me, and I would vault to the top rope into a blind cross body. And on that night, I specifically did not do it intentionally. And I came back and, you know, I... I, I I'm, I'm not as dumb as people think I am. I can count to 20 if I can take my shoes off. Uh, but, I, I, and I'm telling myself in my head, please don't let this be what I'm thinking it is. And I came back and I went up to him and he said, uh, I said, how was it? He said, oh, it was great. And it starts the same generic stuff. And I said, well, how was the cross body? And he went, like he was thinking. And honest to God, in my head, I'm saying, please don't, please say you didn't see one. Please say you didn't see one. And after what seemed to be several seconds, he went, perfect, better than Steamboat. And when he said that, he literally went, like, zip, 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 like this, zip, zinked up to this little tiny thing. Uh, like, and I always tell people today, incredible in-ring performer and fails miserably as a man. 
uh, you know, I, I, to, to me, if somebody comes up and says that to me, and I'm, I'm very cautious of this because I've told that story. When a young guy comes up to me or a girl and says, hey, we watch my match. If I have the time to do it, I will. And if I do, I give them the feedback. And I tell people I don't sugarcoat stuff because it never was to me. And uh, you know, that's how you learn. I, you can come back and I can say, hey, James had a great match. Man, everything was perfect. You're fantastic. You're a star. And if you know that you didn't have a great match, you know, you just came back, you, but you may not know specifically what you did right or wrong, then it takes a seasoned eye to say, well, okay, at this point you did this or that. Uh, and, and my experience is most kids really value that like I would have valued it. And I honestly did not want that to be the case. I wanted Flair to be the guy I had in my head. And, you know, we hear this phrase all the time, like, don't meet your heroes. Uh, I, I, and and I, get, I understand the, the, the adage, but I've met a lot of my heroes, Bruno San Martino. He was larger than I thought, like larger in stature. Uh, just an incredible man. Uh, Dominic, uh, uh, Steamboat, uh, so many guys, you know, that, that did live up to what I had hoped for. And, uh, you know, look, I, I know Rick has a lot of things going on in his life, and I try – Honestly, as I get older, I try very hard to like to give that space to like to, you know we all screw up as human beings, right? Like, uh, and it just seems like with him, it just keeps going on and on and on. Uh, you know, this is we're what thirty years, give or take, past that time. I've long since put that behind. In fact, the first night I worked with Chris, uh, or the first week or two I worked with Chris, we were at a show that Flair was going to be at that was like literally like two weeks after his son had died. And I personal difference with anybody else. My God, that's, that's the worst thing in the world. And uh, Chris was quite nervous. You know, as big as he is, he's like, I'm going to be in trouble. I said, look, dude, I, I, here's what's going to happen. I said, when I walk up to him, he'll, he'll be as nice as can be. He'll call me, sir. Uh, and as we're walking away, he'll be burying me, you know, but that, that's Rick, right? So we walk up, we walk over, and Chris is straggling up behind me. And I got about 10 feet from her, so I put my hands up like this. I went, Rick, I said, uh, he looked at me, he goes, uh, uh, yeah, franchise. I said, Rick, I said, I, our differences aside, I said, I'm heartbroken for you, dude. Like, I, I am so, so sorry. And he went, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks, franchise. And I walked away thinking, like, I said, like, hey, sorry, you lost your boots. Like, it was strange to me. And again, again I'm not saying he sort of wore part of the sleeve like that. I, God forbid anything ever happened to my kids. I doubt that in two weeks I'd be making any appearances. Probably you'd never see me again. Uh, it, it just odd. And I don't mean odd in a good way or a bad way, just not what I would have expected in that moment. Uh, so, yeah, there's, uh, I, I still say to this day, obviously one of the, if not the greatest in ring performer our industry has ever seen, but that giant, to comparison as a man and he slops off precipitously uh, i'm going to uh, i'm going to ask a couple more questions on this sort of theme um now i might say this wrong but do you in the last few years rick flair has not done himself any favors he's divorced his fifth wife because he wants to continue I, I believe it was because he wants to continue on drinking and partying and being rick flair and I'm sure his wife just had enough of it especially with all the health concerns he had the dark side of the ring allegations other things like that is it the kind of thing where you, I don't know, maybe get a sense of schadenfreude or something like that, where you think, hey, I've been saying this for decades, at least more people are agreeing with you now? Yeah, well, surprisingly enough, from the time that it started, like not long after, several people, many close to him, would say to me, I, I get it, you know, I, I, I know, I've known him for 20 years. Um, I, you know, I, I think Rick carries a lot of baggage, and tries to anesthetize himself with that self-medicate. When he was put in a medically induced coma, I, I wrestled with the idea of, should I go public and say anything? Because somebody out there is going to think I'm piling on, uh, not being sincere or whatever. And I hope the fans out there know with me, if I go out of my way to say something to or about somebody, it's because I feel the compulsion to do so. It's not, I, I don't think in terms of agendas and, uh, and I went on Twitter and I posted out, you know, I'm, I'm praying for the nature boy. And, you know, we've seen enough people in our business die, that kind of thing. And he 
luckily came out of it. Now, because of my medical school background, I'm pretty well aware of how dire that is. Uh, you get put into a medically induced coma to save your life. The, 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 the odds are heavily against you of living long after that. Five to 10%, I believe he was given of actually getting out then. Yeah, it's, 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 it's smart. Put it this way. It's the odds that you wouldn't take if, 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 if it was offered to you for a bunch of money. Uh, but when he came out, he seemed to have turned over a new leaf and stayed sober for a while and, uh, uh, you know, and, and seemed to be doing well. And he, uh, by all appearances, seemed happy to me at that time. And not long after that, there was a big time wrestling out of Boston show in, down near Pittsburgh uh, in the Ross Draper Ice Gardens. And my nephew-in-law had taken, had driven me down. So Flair was there, got paid a ton of money. He went out in the very first segment, did like a three-minute promo. And then my, he needed my nephew to drive him back to the airport. So my nephew left. <clears throat> this is the top of the show. I'm on late in the show. Like an hour after the show's over, my nephew still hasn't come back. And we're like an hour from the airport. He ended up finally coming back like an hour and a half, two hours after the, the show had ended. And he apologized. He said, uh, we weren't a mile down the road and Rick maybe pulled into a bar. And he said he stopped at every bar going to the airport. And I went, well, obviously means he's drinking again, right? And like, that's one of those things like, you know, again, you're, if you survive this medically induced coma, straighten up. But you, know, you, you, you got a bad, bad thing coming to you. My take now is for what it's worth, again, trying to play a psychoanalyst, is I don't think Rick Flair, uh, first of all, Richard Flair no longer exists. He's allowed Rick Flair to take over that body. And, and you know, that's, that, there's a real danger to that right? because that is truly a mental illness, right? Like we are playing a role. Um, I'm very keenly aware of the differences of Shane Douglas and Troy Martin, and, and I hope they're very different people. Uh, but like the, the last match thing, I didn't – Full disclosure, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I did watch clips of it. And, you know, close friends of mine kept asking me, you know, why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? Because let's face it, he's one of those guys who, you know, you get this question all the time, you know, who's on your Mount Rushmore? <laughs> you got to put flair there, right? I mean, you can't say the greatest worker in the industry and, and not be on the, on the, the, his legacy is solid. A hundred years from now, wrestling fans will be talking about and studying Ric Flair's work. Uh, so I found it all like, what could you possibly do in that ring that would not detract from that? Because let's face it, none of us can today do what we did 30 years ago, unfortunately. So why do it? And, and my take on it is I, I think that Ric Flair now thinks the only ending to that book is you got to die in the ring, right? I mean, how, you can't die in a hotel room someplace. That's so normal. Uh the oddity of that is that right there in the front row are your kids and grandkids and your co-workers that you admire. Uh, and then, you know, we're hearing these stories, if true, that he blacked out twice or something in the match. Like, those are major, major danger spots, right, for somebody that's in his condition, pacemaker and the comb and everything. Uh, I, I wish for Rick, and I, at this time of the year, Christmas, my, my Christmas wish for Rick Flair, Richard Flair, is that he can find whatever peace uh, he's searching for uh, and live out the rest of his life. That's 50 more years, uh, happy and able to, to look at his grandkids and see just the wonder there and his kids and marvel. And I marvel looking at my boys and thinking, how did this idiot make these guys like that? This is like way above my pay grade. Uh, and I honestly, from, from every fiber of my being, I wish that for Rick. Uh, his legacy is secure. And, you know, now as a man, because we're all men before we're uh, human beings, before we're wrestlers, I, I hope he finds whatever it is he's looking for you know, in peace.